much, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jim Stanford, and I'm the economist and director of the Center for Future Work. The Center for Future Work is a uh, labor economics think tank. Uh, we have an office here in Vancouver, where I am, and an office in Australia. And we do a lot of work uh, in conjunction with the trade union movement uh, and other uh, labor researchers and uh, social justice organizations. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded uh, traditional lands of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations, and uh, pay my respects to those communities and their struggle for self-determination. And please take a moment wherever you are to reflect on the land that you're joining our meeting from uh, and the importance of the struggle for self-determination uh, for all Indigenous peoples in our broader social justice framework. So thank you for that. Uh, so this topic that we're covering today, uh, which is how to extend collective bargaining beyond the realm of one particular workplace or one particular enterprise. And this topic has really become important. I think it's uh, really jumped to the top of the union movement's agenda around the world, and uh, in many cases, the policy and political agenda uh, around the world. Look at some of just some of the initiatives in this regard. We have the New Zealand government, which is now implementing uh, a very innovative and uh, exciting new initiative for extending collective bargaining at the multi-employer or sectoral or regional level. And we're going to hear about that uh, in detail today and how it could apply to Canada. But the discussion is unfolding everywhere else as well. In the European Union, for example, the EU Council has just adopted a minimum wage directive, uh, which instructs, instructs, not just advises, but instructs all members of the EU to try and lift minimum wages to a certain uh, threshold in each country. And they have identified that in order to do that, every country should be aiming for collective bargaining coverage in their respective labor markets of 80%. They have explicitly set out 80% as the goal for collective bargaining coverage. And the data is clear. You cannot reach 80% coverage without multi-employer, industry-wide, sector-wide, occupation-wide structures of collective bargaining. So in effect, the EU is telling its members, you have to uh, implement much wider, stronger uh, uh, collective bargaining systems of the molds that you see in the Nordic countries uh, or some of the other uh, continental countries with uh, sectoral or broader based bargaining. Uh, in Australia, uh, this week, uh, the new government, the Labour government in Australia is going to pass. They've uh, assembled enough support in the Senate to pass uh, a whole comprehensive set of industrial relations changes, including two new streams for multi-employer collective bargaining. One is called supported collective bargaining, uh, for low pay uh, sectors. The other is called single interest collective bargaining for uh, industries where there is a common interest identified among wor uh, workplaces and enterprises. Uh, and those, uh, uh, those initiatives will be supported by directives from the Fair Work Commission, which is the arbitral body uh, in Australia. Uh, closer to home, uh, Kendra Strauss and myself uh, last week were at uh, uh, speakers at the BC Federation of Labor Conference here in Vancouver. And they passed a resolution calling for a sector bargaining. And Sarah knows all about the twisted history of the debates uh, within the union movement over sector bargaining. So the fact that the BC Fed has passed this resolution saying this is an important priority for the next phase of labor law reform, very, very important as well. So this is a conversation that uh, is happening all over the world. It should be happening in Canada as well. And it is happening in Canada. And to facilitate that, our Center for Future Work has partnered with some of the leading thinkers in this area from both academia and from the union movement uh, to think about how do we share resources, how do we foster that discussion, how do we come up with doable, practical policy uh, recommendations and policy visions uh, around extending collective bargaining beyond the uh, confines of one particular workplace or one enterprise. And that is the purpose of our webinar today. I also want to mention that we have created a, a resource, an open access resource on our center's website. Centerforfuturework.ca is the website, and I will share in the chat uh, as the webinar is going on the specific link to the uh, resource page, but we're going to publish uh, all kinds of resources, starting with the discussion paper that Sarah and Mark are uh, covering today, but other con contributions. And anyone is welcome to send me stuff uh, to our email uh, at the center and we'll uh, add it up to the uh, resource page uh, just as a kind of a clearinghouse if you like for information and ideas uh, in this whole area so that's uh, that's the plan think of today as the opening salvo in a conversation that has to continue and uh, we're very pleased uh, at the center to have you know our position if you like uh, with a foot in the academic world and a foot in the union movement uh, is a good a good platform uh, to foster that discussion, uh, I think, in a very constructive 
uh, way without any of the institutional rivalries that sometimes bedevil these discussions. So uh, that's it by way of uh, introduction. Our agenda today, we're going to hear the opening presentation from Sarah and uh, Mark uh, in just a moment. Then we're going to have three comments from three different provinces about how the sector bargaining, a, a broader based bargaining discussion is unfolding there. And then we'll turn it over for questions and discussion. Uh, please, uh, if you'd like to contribute something to the discussion, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, submit your question there, and then I will be uh, curating the questions uh, as we go forward and trying to make sure we have a good uh, representative mix of questions to put to the speakers. Uh, so that's enough. Let's get to it since our time is limited. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, our uh, initial speakers. Sarah Slynn is Associate Professor in Osgoode Hall uh, at York University uh, on uh, labor law and uh, really one of Canada's outstanding uh, labor law academics, has made huge contributions to the union movement's engagement around labor law reform. And uh, Mark Rowlandson, a longtime staffer at the United Steelworkers and now a partner um, at uh, Goldblatt, uh, the labor law firm based in uh, Toronto and uh, is also bringing a very hands-on, very rich hands-on experience uh, with these matters. So Sarah and uh, Mark have prepared a discussion paper on the New Zealand fair pay agreement system and how it might work uh, in Canada. And that's what will kick it off. So Sarah, I'll give it to you first. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us and um, welcome. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, I will just uh, share my screen here. So. Uh, Thanks very much to, to Jim and the Center for Future Work for hosting today's session. Uh, what Mark and I'd like to talk about is a possible approach to a fair pay agreement system for Canadian workplaces. Uh, our starting point and inspiration for this proposal is the recent New Zealand legislation, the Fair Pay Act, uh, which was just passed in November and will come into operation in December. But our proposal is also reflecting and incorporating key Canadian collective bargaining concepts and uh, the, the realities of uh, the Canadian uh, labor market and context. So in essence, uh, both under the New Zealand legislation and our proposal, a uh, fair pay agreement is a sector that is to say occupation or industry-wide collective agreement that's bargained by an employer association and union council for minimum terms of work across the sector. So there is uh, in indeed ample evidence that centralized bargaining structures such as this um, offer significant benefits to workers, uh, to the economy more generally, and to employers by reducing wage competition. So first, as, as context, a couple of words on the New Zealand Fair Pay Act. Uh, it, it is uh, providing collective bargaining for, on a sector-wide basis. Uh, for minimum terms of employment. As I mentioned, it's coming into force imminently. It, the government has uh, rejected explicitly the, the low cost model, which it describes as producing a race to the bottom and, and attendance stagnating productivity uh, in adopting this legislation. And the government's identified a number of benefits to employees that they anticipate improving wages and employment conditions, reducing vulnerability and disparity among workers, and increasing bargaining power and strengthening the labor market. But there are also anticipated benefits for employers, and here the government points to leveling the playing field for employers, so that, offer, that employers who offer fair terms to employees won't be undercut and disadvantaged, uh, so removing um, this, this unfair competition as an element. Now, this particular model reflects uh, what's often called a wage board or wages council or workers board form of sectoral bargaining. Uh, and essentially there you have a board of employer and union representatives negotiating minimum standards on a sector based uh, sta uh, on a sectoral basis with government approval of the terms. So this kind of sectoral bargaining was in place. In the UK, for example, for much of the 20th century and in several Canadian jurisdictions. Um, so, for example, the Industrial Standards Act system is a, a wage council type model. And in these cases, the impetus was uh, really around, first of all, providing adequate minimum working conditions, but also removing unfair competition among employers based on wages. 
And there are currently a number of proposals in the United States for wage board type sectoral bargaining models. So this kind of framework is garnering a lot of interest uh, right now, in addition to the developments in, in New Zealand and Australia. So in terms of thinking about a fair pay agreement system for Canada, uh, this proposal and really starting point for discussion uh, arose out of some discussions and meetings of an informal working group that started thinking about the New Zealand model and how it might operate in this context. It really, again, is an exploratory uh, set uh, of ideas. And it we had as, a, as guiding principles uh, the notion that uh, sectoral standards should be bargained by democratically selected and accountable bargaining agents, that it should operate in parallel and not compete with or interfere with existing collective representation rights and collective agreements, and that it should apply very broadly, so to all workers in employment relationships. And, and essentially, it, was in, it is intended to remove key employment terms and conditions uh, from competition and thereby uh, essentially leveling, leveling the playing field here also. So just as a brief overview of the system and, and Mark will provide more details on many of these elements. Um, first, we intended that this should apply broadly to workers uh, and operationalized by the ABC test for who constitutes an employee that's been adopted in many jurisdictions in the United States. So it would include dependent contractors and gig and platform workers. And the only exclusion we would contemplate would be uh, for managerial, on a managerial basis. Now, it would apply to sectors other than a high union density sectors or de sectors that have existing sectoral bargaining. And the purpose of this is to uh, preserve existing collective bargaining arrangements uh, and therefore uh, not interfere with existing rights and existing collective agreements. It also incorporates a, a non-majoritarian test uh, to be able to access the fair pay negotiation framework and contemplates bargaining between union and employer councils for a fair pay agreement, which would be a collective agreement, including minimum standards that would apply across the sector. It would be incorporated into the existing labor relations uh, system in the sense that uh, labor relations boards would be administering and supervising the, the system. And uh, we would suggest that even though this would be contemplated to be brought in through separate legislation, that it would be the Ministry of Labor that would oversee and, and provide resources and dispute resolution uh, for fair, fair pay bargaining and fair pay agreements. Now, in terms of, of what we're talking about for a sector under the fair pay agreement uh, model, uh, a sector would operate as the bargaining unit and it would have two key dimensions. Uh, one, the industry or occupation. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, a geographic dimension. Uh, in terms of the geographic dimension, there'd be a preference for larger uh, larger sectors, geographically speaking, but sub-national, sub-provincial, sub-municipal even would be possible as long as they are appropriate for collective bargaining. And there would also be presumption in favor of approving a sector as appropriate for collective bargaining. Uh, in terms of uh, acquiring a uh, fair pay agreement uh, bargaining rights, there would be two tests uh, available. The primary test would be a threshold test uh, where the applicant union would demonstrate support either of 10% of the sector workforce or 500 employees in the proposed sector. So a non-majoritarian test for, uh, for representation rights. Alternatively, and to be uh, applied to sectors where uh, this, the applicant was not able to demonstrate um, sufficient support under the threshold test. Uh, and if that sector uh, can uh, be described and is found to be characterized by low pay, low working conditions and or precarious work or low bargaining power, uh, 
the, the Labor Board may approve and provide bargaining rights, uh, although there's not, uh, the applicant hasn't yet met the threshold test. So now I will uh, turn it over to uh, Mark. And I will unmute myself. Hello, everybody. Uh, next, Sarah's going to continue to operate the slides. Uh, Sarah, next slide. There we go. So um, one of the sort of central challenges, it seems to us, whenever you're bargaining, starting from a non-majoritarian certification where you could theoretically have uh, an application that had 700 membership cards covering a unit of, say, 40,000 members, the first one of the first challenges, obviously, is uh, how do you, you know, how do you provide notice and how do you communicate with particularly the employees who are going to be covered by the FPA uh, during the course of bargaining and the New Zealand legislation provides that uh, the application uh, that all affected employers must receive notice of the application. And once the FPA is initiated, that is to say, once the Labor Board or its New Zealand equivalent has determined that it is, it's an appropriate sector for sectoral bargaining, uh, all employers receive notice and all employers are re required by under the legislation to provide uh, notice to their own employees that they are going to be covered by uh, this uh, sector bargaining arrangement. It's also mandatory under the New Zealand legislation uh, that employers must provide names and contact information for all of the employees in their employee who are to be covered by the FBA to the bargaining agent. So, so this is a fairly elaborate and necessary exchange of information that has to take place. Uh, furthermore, employers are required to provide uh, the union or unions who are bargaining the, the FPA access to the workplace uh, twice uh, for two separate meetings to meet with all of the employees to, who are going to be covered by the FPA. Uh, those meetings take place during the course of collective bargaining if, in fact, and we'll get to ratification in a minute, if the FPA is not ratified by the employees, uh, then uh, actually the employer is required to give the union a, a third meeting uh, in workplaces to talk to the workers about, about the FPA. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the New Zealand legislation and our proposed model would also uh, contemplate more robust government support for the parties during bargaining, uh, wage data, research the, uh, support, um, uh, assistance and assistance in terms of, of identifying employers and communicating with employees. The New Zealand legislation doesn't necessarily contain a broad duty to bargain in good faith as we would understand it. It actually, it actually contains a duty to act in good faith towards all other parties, including, for example, union of quite unions and the other unions. Uh, we would pro we, we propose to just incorporate a duty to bargain in good faith. Uh, again, to be potentially litigated uh, uh, at uh, the Labor Board um, and as a possible remedy, the possible expansion of the list of bargaining issues that could be put before an arbitrator if and when uh, the, uh, the FPA negotiations end up before an interest arbitrator. Uh, as I mentioned, under the New Zealand model and, and under our proposed model in Canada, uh, any FPA that's negotiated must be ratified. Uh, employees obviously would have access to electronic votes for, for the ratification. Employers must also ratify the agreement. Um, and there is the possibility in the New Zealand legislation, and we would certainly at least contemplate this possibility in Canada, that the employers would actually have a weighted vote. Because you can imagine a situation where if uh, a group of unions applied for a sectoral FPA to bargain on behalf of all warehouse workers, uh, in Brampton, let's say outside of Toronto, you could have Amazon that might have 20,000 workers in the in the agreement and, you know, a small little warehouse with 30 employees and uh, also covered by the agreement and, and that under the New Zealand legislation, employer ratification is weighted by the number of workers that you have in the unit. And so that would be the small employer would essentially have no voice. So they have a system to actually provide greater weight and voice to small and medium-sized employers. Uh, next uh, slide, Sarah, thanks. Uh, 
So who actually bargains these agreements? Um, again, in the New Zealand model, the, the notion is that it's a council of unions bargaining with a council of employers. Uh, under the New Zealand legislation, there is actually a three month period post certification during which time the unions and the employers uh, are intended to organize themselves into a council uh, that is able to collectively bargain in uh, some sort of cohesive fashion. Um, we spent a lot of time debating back and forth who would be, for example, in the union council. Um, and concluded the only way of doing it was, I think, the way it's done. The, the way it's done in New Zealand, which is that any union that had either existing members that were certified and covered by the FPA, that is to say, under the traditional Labor Relations Act method, or even any union that subsequently certified was certified to represent members covered by the FPA, would automatically have the ability, uh, a seat on the union council negotiating the FPA. And we, we can elaborate a little bit on that, but I, otherwise I don't see how, how, how it would work. And again, you could potentially have weighted voting amongst the council members, um, but, uh, but, but it would clearly be one ca a council of unions bargaining with a council of employers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of bargaining subjects, again, we have essentially adapted the New Zealand model, uh, in our view, to fit a, a sort of a, you know a Canadian reality under the New Zealand model. Um, again, you have this mandatory to agree category of items that must be in covered by the fair pay agreement by the FPA, and then there is a mandatory to discuss list where the parties are required to discuss those items during bargaining, but they are not necessarily required to include provisions covering those items in the agreement itself. Um, and so you see the list here of what we would propose uh, in terms of mandatory to agree items. Uh, we propose, for example, an initial FPA term of three years. Renewal agreements could be somewhat longer, three to five years. Um, and they would essentially cover, we have added pensions and benefits is not a mandatory to agree item under the New Zealand legislation. Um, and nor are union member payments, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, which are essentially the, the, the system that we think should be, we propose uh, as, a, as a sort of slight spin uh, twist on Canadian mandatory dues collection. So other than that, it follows the New Zealand model fairly closely. Uh, I will say, the concept of, of mandatory items of bargaining and non-mandatory items of bargaining, one of the criticisms that I've heard from some is that this is actually importing somewhat of an American, a US uh, concept of collective bargaining where this mandatory items of bargaining and non-mandatory items of bargaining is part of their labor relations uh, legal regime. Um, and I, you know, I think I'm sensitive to that concern, but I think that given the way that this bargaining would take place, given its broad sectoral uh, application, I think there has to be uh, and of course, the parties could agree to bargain about any topic they wanted, provided under the New Zealand legislation, uh, it was a topic regarding the employees covered by the agreement. So it has to just any anything about employment can be bargained voluntarily, but the part the only items the parties have to agree on are the mandatory to agree items. Next slide. Um, under the New Zealand legislation. Uh, uh, and this is not perhaps not entirely clear in our paper, there is no access to uh, unions do not have the ability to strike and employers do not have the ability to lock out. There is no strike or lockout option. Um, collective agreements, uh, sorry, FPAs must be, uh, must be ratified, as I mentioned earlier, by employees and employers. If they are either not ratified, that is to say, if they have been rejected by one party or another twice, and after intensive government mediation, um, particularly in respect of the first FPA, and, and Sarah and I have talked about perhaps adopting a model that looks something like first contract arbitration and mediation as applied in British Columbia. Uh, if the parties are unable to ultimately agree on an FPA, then the matters are, then everything that remains outstanding is sent to mandatory interest arbitration. That's the, that's the case with the New Zealand legislation. And that's the, that's what we would, that's what we would propose here. Um, the arbitrator has the authority to decide all mandatory to agree items. Uh, and um, upon application, 
uh, could, by either party could decide mandatory to discuss items within the arbitrator's discretion. And then the parties could agree to send any other items that they wished on a consensual basis to arbitration as well. Um, as everyone on, on this, you know, in this call, I'm sure is aware, Canada has a pretty elaborate and well-established uh, system for interest arbitration at, at present, particularly in, in areas, you know, it varies province by province, but we would we would again expect that an arbitrator under this system would adopt the fairly well established kind of our Canadian arbitral interest arbitration norms and principles. Um, certain other matters, though, such as the scope of the bargaining unit, questions about accretion to the unit, or issues around overlapping FPAs, you can imagine a circumstance where one union or group of unions might apply for a sectoral an economic sectoral uh, unit and another group may apply for uh, a more occupationally based unit and there may be overlapping coverage. All of those kinds of issues would be determined by a labor and employment tribunal, uh, the labor relations board or such whatever tribunal uh, would be established in order to determine these questions. Those would not be before the arbitrator. Um, next slide. Um, one of the issues that we went back and forth on quite a lot, to be honest, is this question of, of dues. Uh, the, the New Zealand model does not contemplate mandatory uh, or automatically remitted or deducted union dues. Um, instead, what it contemplates is something called it calls a union member payment, um, but it's not mandatory, it's voluntary. So if a union member payment is essentially a scheme under which if an employee decides to join a union, uh, upon a, a, the, the employer may uh, increase their wage rate in an amount equivalent to the membership dues of that particular unit, un, union. Um, so it's not quite a sort of mandatory deduction. It's a, it's a wage increase equal to union dues, if you will. But under the New Zealand legislation, as I mentioned earlier, it's not voluntary. It's not mandatory. Employers do not have to agree to make this union member payment. We think that given our uh, collective bargaining history, the RAND formula, the, the sort of generally accepted idea of uh, mandatory union dues that we would make this union member payment, a similar idea, but make it mandatory should the, should the union ask for it. That's to say, if union asks for such a provision in the FPA during bargaining, it must be included. Uh, the the, 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 the trade-off for that would be that there would be a duty of fair representation for those uh, members covered by an FPA who choose to be a member of a union. So what that means is that if you are a worker, a non-union worker, and you are covered by, and then all of a sudden uh, you are informed that you an FPA is to be bargained on your behalf, you have an opportunity to review and ratify the agreement, during none of that process do you have to become a member of the union necessarily. In fact, you know, our, as I said, it's a non-majoritarian principle. If once you are covered by an FPA, for example, you decide that you want to become a member of a union and you could presumably become a member of any of the unions that would be in the council that has bargained the FPA, you could become a member of that union uh, your dues would be covered by a concomitant wage increase from your employer, and you would then be entitled to a sort of suite of representational uh, uh, rights vis-a-vis -vis your the enforcement of your FPA. So if we can go to the next slide, Sarah. Mark, we should wrap up in a minute or two if we can. I'll be done in two minutes. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, actually, this slide here, very quickly, uh, we would propose somewhat like the New Zealand legislation that the Canadian model would have similar access to unfair labor practice, litigation and protections against interference, discrimination and coercion, much like uh, more or less all of uh, existing Canadian labor relations jurisdictions. Next slide, Sarah. And so in terms of enforcement, we propose that it would be a complaint-based enforcement mechanism where the employee him or herself can complain or the union can bring an enforcement case on behalf of the employee to the Ministry of Labor or equivalent would be investigated and a ministry officer would then issue an order which could be appealed to the tribunal, much like, for example, the Employment Standards Act or minimum standards legislation in many Canadian provinces. What you get for signing up to be a union member, in addition to all the other benefits of, union, of being a member of a union, is that you get 
uh, the union can bring these cases and represent you in respect of the enforcement of the FPA. Uh, next slide, Sarah. Um, and lastly, in terms of relationships with existing agreements, we've gone out of our way in our proposal, and I won't spend much time on this to make it clear that this system would not derogate from existing collective agreements or minimum standards. It would be essentially bargaining a floor on top of which unions could bargain uh, collective agreements. And, and, and if, if and the New Zealand legislation provides, and we would also provide that if there was to be a conflict between the FPA and an existing collective agreement, the employee gets access to the better provision, whichever would be bargained. Um, but it wouldn't, it would not seek to replace, as I said, or derogate from our existing collective uh, bargaining regime. Uh, last slide, Sarah. So we have a number of questions and I'm just gonna pass it over here to our commentators, but some of the questions that we have, you can see here on the screen. Um, for example, what will some of the main objections be to this model from policymakers, from employers, from unions even? Uh, how should, you know, is the, have, we, have we identified what a sector should be appropriately in a way that works? Uh, and we've tried to identify some of the new resources that would be required in order to create and maintain the system, but I think there's probably more thinking and, and, and input to be done on there. Uh, and how will this FPA model work with our existing collective bargaining uh, relationships? Again, our uh, we, we think we've come up with a model where they, they would complement one another, but, but there's probably, again, more comments and thoughts to be done on that. Um, so those are our, our opening remarks, and uh, I, I'm going to pass it back, I think, to Jim or possibly directly over to Brad uh, for his thoughts at this time. Back to me. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark and Sarah. That is incredibly detailed work, and uh, it's so important to, as we're having these discussions, to go from this grand concept that we all think is very appealing down to the nitty gritty of how we would actually make this happen within the context of our uh, labor law system in Canada. So uh, thank you all, thank you both for that. Uh, just a reminder, there's a lot more detail in the discussion paper that Sarah and Mark have written that is posted on our resource site. And I've sent the link around in the chat to our resource site. So please see that uh, for more information. Also, in response to a couple of queries during the uh, presentation, we will post both the slides that Mark and Sarah used and a recording of this whole webinar on that same resource page. So for folks uh, who wanna go back and check, uh, please see that. Okay, uh, we're gonna carry on with the three commentators who are gonna discuss both the New Zealand system, but the concept of uh, sector and broader based bargaining more generally in the context of their own uh, provinces. Because uh, of course, we have to have the provincial detail in any Canadian discussion about this. And uh, we're going randomly in order of population of the province. So we're starting with uh, Ontario. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brad James, a longtime organizing director for the Steelworkers, and now just uh, uh, retired from the Steelworkers, but very engaged in policy debates about uh, how we strengthen the labor movement going forward. Brad, tell us your view from Ontario, please. Uh, thanks very much. Hope you can all hear me. And thanks to Sarah and to Mark for writing uh, such a compelling paper. And thanks to Jim and the Center for putting on this event. Um, I'm wearing my uh, local 75 hat today, Carpenter's local 75, because I built a fence with my neighbor who's a steward in the uh, in the, uh, uh, the the world of sectoral bargaining. And I meant to have my steelworkers hat and put it on because that's who I'll speak about. But I couldn't find it. So uh, I hope uh, Ken Newman doesn't. Uh, doesn't hear about this, but I can't find my steelworkers hat. Um, first couple of things I thought I'd say is that um, what I found most interesting about this paper is that in contrast to the um, uh, recommendations made by Ontario's Changing Workplaces Review a few years ago, where uh, uh, John Murray and Michael Mitchell proposed that there be a sectoral bargaining approach brought in for franchise workers, that is a, a tweak to the Labor Relations Act. This is something much broader to undergird the entire labor relations system. So not a tweak, but a much grander and um, much more of uh, what my friend David McKenzie described, said to me the other day was an industrial policy approach. And that's most interesting. Um, I noted uh, that uh, one of the phrases I found interesting, a quote from the OECD, that this is sort of organized decentralization, which I thought also described my own union and perhaps Canada well. Um, I do have a few comments at the end about the occupation versus sectoral 
designations. But I think from my perspective, what I thought I would say is just to speak a little bit about this as a former union organizer and from the very, very parochial point of view about union density. All of us know that private sector union density is in, on, in Canada is on a rocket ride downward. Um, a recent, a brand new publication from Stats Canada showed that uh, we're now at 15.2% in what it calls the commercial uh, sector uh, comparison. Uh, in 1981, uh, union density in the, in the commercial sector was 29%. So we've dropped by half. Um, what else is going on? Applications for certification in uh, the province of Ontario, which Jim asked me to speak about, um, have been um, on a rocket ride downward for the last decade. The number of employees covered by new certifications has been dropping each year. Um, and the, the, the anecdotal reports of increases in organizing have not yet been seen. So why isn't the labor movement's hair on fire about this? I don't have any hair, but why isn't the labor movement's hair on fire about this? Um, uh, why isn't uh, why haven't uh, progressive political parties uh, um, had their uh, 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 been active in this area? I will note that in 2018, the Ontario NDP did propose in its platform that there uh, it had it wasn't a footnote, but it was it wasn't really even a bullet point. There was a mention of sectoral bargaining, uh, but in the 2022 platform from the Ontario NDP, not a mention of it. As well, not a mention of, 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 of uh, alternate bargaining approaches in the last federal NDP platform, not a mention of it at all. I do agree, Sarah's paper in 2020 on some of the reasons for the labor movement's reticence on this um, uh, really resonate with me that unions um, have, despite recent positive examples in Ontario around cooperation between unions, there are still some concerns about jurisdictional issues. Um, about um, um, just the general lack of cooperation uh, in the labor movement and some barriers to overcome there. Also, as a former union staffer, I think I'll say this, is that most union organizers barely have time to breathe and reflect on the system, on, on the sea in which they swim. Union organizers are um, uh, rewarded and uh, incentivized to produce certifications, uh, not to question the system in which they're working. In fact, because organizing is challenging, uh, unions, I think, sometimes over-celebrate the new organizing campaigns without actually thinking about whether that bargaining unit is sustainable or durable, is the right thing to have organized. Um, uh, that's, those are some of the reasons I think that unions aren't um, um, more active in this on this file. I'll also say that, and I'm happy to see that uh, Jim Center is trying to bridge the gap between uh, the world of academia and the world of labor movement. I think that those links are um, far too distant. And the kind of analytical approach or the kind of research analysis isn't penetrating the labor movement the way it needs to. So I'm happy to see this event. I think it's been something that's, that's long overdue. Also, I think generally the complexity of this model makes it difficult for union leaders who are very pressed for time and resources to really wrap their heads around. So what would I suggest? First of all, I'd suggest that uh, I look back at my own experience when I moved to our union's national office. We took a, a, a look at our organizing results from about uh, two decades, and we then looked for the last five years and we tried to look at the life cycle of new units. I won't give you the exact numbers because they were a bit challenging, but the number of new units that we organized did they exist five years later? Were we able to achieve a first contract? Did the bargaining unit sustain itself at a surprisingly high level of attrition? So unions do a great job of celebrating new bargaining units. I think, though, looking at whether those bargaining units can exist and be durable and produce effective gains for workers is something that unions do far too little of. Um, as well, looking at just at the general um, uh, decline in private sector union density union leaders need to be brought around the table or to bring themselves around the table and stare much more closely at that toboggan ride downwards. The prospect of hanging should concentrate our minds. I think the last uh, thing I'll say is that I'm happy that my union was the uh, was the sponsor, was the uh, submitted the resolution. Here it is. Uh, you can't really see it because it's all blurred out in BC for the BC Fed to um, make a move toward uh, sectoral bargaining. I note that what's I think most important about it is it contains a commitment to uh, engage in uh, member and worker education around this issue, because I think moving activists and staff who have very busy lives into thinking about something different than the Wagner Act enterprise level of bargaining is something that will be a bit of a Herculean effort. Um, I think the last comment I'll say is that I'm. Uh, I, I'm most interested in how unions would be able to activate this FPA model 
given this, the, the relative small size of organizing departments, these large organizing campaigns, especially on a big geographic basis, I think is something that will be a challenge for unions if we were able to adopt the system today. And I'm, I'm most interested in the concept of how unions could get access to employee information earlier in the process. Uh, but anyway, I, I found the paper fascinating. Um, I think organizers uh, would, uh, uh, I think organizers themselves spending some time thinking about a different organizing model would also be very important to the union movement to initiate. And with that, I'll stop and go look for my skills as well. Brad, thank you very much. Uh, very important to think about how does this actually get understood at the ground level of union organizing and union leadership. Uh, and you're quite right about the, the mental leap that it is going to take for people who've worked in a certain way of doing things uh, to imagine a very different way of doing things. So uh, thank you very much for those uh, comments. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, introduce our friend uh, Patrice Gillette. Uh, Patrice is the uh, professor, a professor uh, at the uh, Ecole de Relation Industrielle at the Université de Montréal. Uh, but Patrice is not joining us from Montreal. He's joining us from Sofia, Bulgaria today, which is a, a story in its own right. Uh, Patrice, thank you very much for joining our conversation. Uh, despite the, uh, the travel that you've uh, undertaken today, we're really glad to hear a Quebec perspective uh, on how to make this work. Thank you. So thank you, Jim. So despite the rumors, I'm not in Sofia to study the Bulgarian broad-based bargaining. So the four the four Bs. No. So I'm, so first, uh, just a sec. Okay. So first, I want to acknowledge the rich work uh, that Sarah and Mark are doing to help us to rethink uh, collective representation and make it more accessible to Canadian workers. This is essential thinking that that must continue. Um, I think that FPA has a great potential of development in, in, in Quebec. Uh, we have experience with joint sectoral uh, governance uh, with the decree system, the labor development sectoral committees, the construction industry. So I think that we could live with the FDA, the, the F, uh, FPAs, uh, I, I, at least in theory. Uh, coming from Quebec, I can help but notice the similarities and differences between the Canadian FPA model and the collective agreement decree regime. In light of my knowledge of this system, I think that the FPA model constitutes an important advance over the decree system, particularly regarding the application to initiate bargaining uh, FPA uh, for a specific sector. The application process must be clear and precise as possible, but above all, it mustn't be un, uh, entrusted by labor boards. Uh, the problem with the decree system, one of the problem with the decree system is that the process is, is very vague and, pre and precise, so no one knows for sure how to initiate it and the decision as to whether a decree can be granted or not will ultimately be left to the government. You don't want you don't want this for FPA. You should not leave FPA to the government discretion, as it is the case for the decree system. Another important issue arise from the experience of the decrees is that of integration, recognize, recognizing the, the coexistence of, labor, of the labor code regime and local collective agreement, and that of the FPA workers. Workers must be able to choose the regime that will apply to them collectively. I may have missed something in Sarah and Mark's paper and uh, the presentation, uh, but it seemed to me that the rights and obligation of workers were not exactly the same whether they were unionized or not. While unionized workers must pay union dues, this is, this is not the case for non-unionized workers who, as I understand, will benefit from union action particularly with regards to the negotiation of the sectoral agreement. However, this issue seemed to me to have been settled in Canada by the RAND formula. Unions will argue that this difference in treatment will not, uh, will not help them to organize workers who will benefit from their action without having to contribute financially. Perhaps an, emplo an employee and employer contribution to fund the surveillance and, uh, of the, uh, the, the sectoral agreement could ensure uh, some equity and resources are available to ensure that the decree is enforced. Under the decree system, 
all employers, whether unionized or not, and even employers contribute financially to the administration and enforcing of the degree. Uh, also, I'm a bit worried about the uh, sector uh, sectors exposed to national to international competition. How do we balance between the objective of taking wages out of the competition uh, and the capacity to uh, uh, of the sectors to compete internationally? Uh, in, Quebec, in in Quebec, what happens is that the uh, uh, the decree system is limited to local services. Uh, there is no decree anymore in the manufacturing sector. So, however, despite these few comments, I, I believe that Sarah and Mark's proposal is quite remarkable and should be carried out and discussed in the in the in the industrial uh, relation community and beyond. Once again, many thanks to Sarah and Mark for their stimulating contribution, and thank you, Jim, for having organized this uh, this seminar to circulate this important debate. Thank you. Oh, Patrice, thank you so much. Uh, that was incredibly rich uh, for staying uh, completely within the time limit. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think your uh, detailed compare and contrast between the decree system and the FPA model is, is very important. Um, in fact, I think the decree system itself is not sufficiently known and understood in English Canada at all, uh, which is a shame because it is a remarkable in innovation in its own right. Of course, it's you know evolved over the years, but uh, I'm thinking perhaps another installment of this might be to have a deeper dive into the decree system, how it operates, where it's still operating, and then further explore some of those challenges. Uh, so perhaps Patrice will come and hit you up for that. Uh, as well. And then we'll hit you up a third time to describe Bulgarian broader based bargaining and other tongue twisters. Okay. Uh, now our, our third commentator, and then we'll move to the uh, uh, Q&A with the audience. Uh, very glad to share uh, Professor Kendra Strauss. Uh, Kendra is the director of the Labor Studies Program at Simon Fraser University here in uh, BC and uh, also an expert on uh, changes in the labor market, precarious work, and how our labor structures uh, adapt to uh, respond to those. So Kendra, please share us your thoughts on how this would be relevant in BC. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, thanks to Patrice and Brad for their comments and Sarah and Mark for the presentation. Um, I'm going to, I prepared some comments that I'm going to read to try and help me keep to time because, you know, we academics are notorious for not keeping to time. So, um, so as people have already mentioned, you know, this, um, this paper is, is really both timely and important and timely because, you know, as evidenced in BC, there's kind of growing recognition um, that sectoral bargaining can be good for workers and potentially for the labor movement. And it's important because it's clear that our current labor law regime is simply not up to the challenge of supporting the collective organization of the most vulnerable, precarious, and lowest paid workers. So in other words, those kind of most in need of union representation and protection in our current economy and labor markets are at the moment, you know, among the least likely to have those protections. So in BC, for example, the reinstatement of the card check system of single step or automatic certification, um, which has only you know, been in place since June, has, has seen um, you know, a small uptick of successful union drives in hard to organize sectors. So we've seen some very newsworthy stories of retail and food services um, outlets, a Starbucks in Victoria, a Sephora store in Kamloops. But the reality of having to organize and certify at the workplace or enterprise level means really quite incremental gains without the guarantee that the union can then successfully bargain its first contract, which, as we've seen in the case of the um, Starbucks store in Victoria, you know, is a really significant challenge. And so while these sectors may include many small businesses, they are also the terrain, of course, of corporate giants and franchise models, which, as Brad noted, was recognized um, in the Ontario Review. So, you know, at the same time, the expansion of ride hailing and food delivery apps into BC has really spurred debate in the province about how to combat the misclassification of workers as independent contractors. 
And this is a problem that is increasingly seen across a range of sectors, including ones like healthcare and education. So the inclusion of the ABC test into the model proposed in this paper is something that really shouldn't be ignored. Many of the workers most at risk of precarious employment or those whose employment is precarious by its very definition, so as in the case of temporary foreign workers with tied work permits, are also racialized immigrant and migrant workers. So for them in BC, for example, we know that the Employment Standards Act does not provide an adequate floor of rights given well-documented problems with exclusions and a lack of enforcement and organizing remains a huge struggle under our current systems. So I think the proposals in this discussion paper really thoughtfully and cogently address how the sectoral bargaining legislation proposed in New Zealand could be adapted to provide a floor, and I think that's important, of workplace rights and protections in a way that strengthens the labor movement and the role of unions. And that's in part because this floor still um, has opportunities for unions to show the benefits of, of union membership, including, for example, through bargained benefits like access to an employer-provided pension. So if we address the BC case, the adoption of the resolution calling for the government to enact sectoral bargaining, I think actually really recognizes the limitations to our current labor law regime, even with automatic certification to promote collective representation and bargaining for workers in sectors and industries where fissuring, precarious employment conditions, misclassification and low pay are endemic. The public interest test, I think, makes the FPA proposal particularly powerful for addressing these conditions in those sectors while, ex while potentially expanding union coverage. The scope of coverage and overlapping coverage provisions for unionized sectors, I do think, help ensure that FPAs genuinely target sectors and industries where workers need and would benefit from coverage. At the same time, for employers in sectors suffering labor shortages, so there's, this is a big discourse in BC as in elsewhere, it removes wage competition. So thinking about hospitality and food services sectors. Um, although, of course, that doesn't mean that there won't be resistance. So I'll just conclude with some final thoughts on the BC case, because it's interesting in part because it suggests some of the challenges in jurisdictions that are nominally labor friendly. The proposals require pretty significant investment, both political and financial, in bargaining supports, communication, and education. The underfunding of the enforcement of employment standards in BC, which has yet to be addressed by the NDP government here, suggests ongoing reluctance to invest in, rather than kind of passively support or enable, worker organizing. The same appears to be true in relation to exclusions from the ESA that apply to workers in sectors like agriculture, which the NDP has so far been unwilling to remove. So the BC Fed resolution, I think, suggests that political momentum is building, but the limits to NDP supports of workers in BC suggest that some of the barriers to sectoral bargaining remain the state's investment in the status quo. So that's, you know, not a surprising statement, but I think we need to remember this. So this is going to require both political mobilization within the labor movement, but also more broadly to sell the benefits to all workers. And uh, I'm going to conclude there. Kendra, thank you so much. That was very, very rich. And uh, since you've written out the comments, can I ask you to submit the comments for our resource page? I think that would be a fabulous uh, addition. Thank you. And I'll make the same offer to Brad and Patrice if you have anything associated with your comments that you'd like to send in or anything else, period, on this topic, uh, we'll post it. Um, okay, well, that uh, concludes our formal presentations. Uh, I'm going to suggest we take about 20 minutes now for Q&A from the uh, audience. Uh, all of our speakers have indicated they're able to, to stay uh, for that period of time. We've received a few of them uh, already. Um, so I'll start, uh, I'll start forwarding them. If uh, In some cases, I'll direct them to, to someone in particular. But if any of our other speakers uh, want to jump in, please just unmute and shout out or, or raise your hand. Uh, we had one very interesting question from uh, Morna Ballantyne, uh, who's the longtime uh, leader in the child care movement. Uh, in Canada, um, who says, uh, how could this system apply in the childcare sector, uh, which has low unionization uh, right now, and obviously uh, inferior wages and working conditions, given the feminized nature of the sector and the underfunded uh, uh, history of the sector. Um, any suggestions for how it could help in childcare? And I think a similar argument or question could be posed around other caring labor sectors, uh, including aged care, home care, uh, 
uh, et cetera. So maybe I'll, I'll start to see if Sarah um, or Mark have uh, have something on that. I can I can uh, try and address it. Um, I think that there are a number of organizations and unions who are involved and interested in sectors like child care. Um, we do have some sector based um, bargaining regimes in Quebec, for example, that deal specifically with child care and home care workers. They're structurally problematic, that legislation, but um, there certainly, I think, is scope for that kind of sector-based um, negotiation of, of floor-level standards for these types of workers. I don't see any particular barrier to that set of vulnerable workers. Uh, Patrice, I was thinking of Quebec as well on the childcare uh, system there. Do you have anything to add on how it works and um, things to learn and not learn from it? I, I would say one thing. I, I think, of course, that the 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 the, the funding of the of the sec of the sector by the government helped to uh, create this centralization. It's not a centralization; it's still uh, decentralized, but it helped to, to create this uh, special regime uh, since, uh, take it, uh, it, it, it's always the government that is funding uh, the, these services. So uh, having said that, I, I think that it would be a good, uh, a good sector that, that could uh, bene benefit uh, potentially from the uh, FPA model. Excellent, uh, Kendra. Can I just say quickly, I think part of what Morna is is getting at is the question of the extent to which workers themselves have a say in setting those standards. And I think that is a really important point in sectors that don't have, you know, strong involvement of unions and, and the ability to kind of bring workers into roles where they can participate. And so if we think about sort of the public interest test, it would be something to consider, you know, how do you meaningfully involve workers in, in the process of, of bargaining and the negotiation of those standards? And I, I do think uh, Sarah and Mark's paper, you know, set out a framework for that, but I think it would really require a commitment to foregrounding worker voice in those structures. Uh, thank you, Kendra. Thank you. So uh, we've got questions flowing into the Q&A um, uh, system there. Uh, if you have a question to contribute, please uh, please type it in. Um, Denise Moffat uh, has sent in uh, a couple of questions, actually, and I'm just going to kind of combine uh, some of them that, that uh, seem particularly interesting into one composite question, uh, if you like. Uh, so we'll, and we'll address it first to Mark and Sarah. Uh, first, Denise asks, um, from the New Zealand system, uh, the, com the catalog of topics that are mandatory to agree or mandatory to discuss, where does occupational health and safety uh, fit into that? And shouldn't that be one of the ones that's mandatory to agree? Secondly, uh, in that system or in the Canadian adaptation of that system, how would we handle the issue of multiple unions in one workplace? If there were multiple unions involved in uh, negotiating the fair pay agreement, and then individual workers could opt in. Uh, you noted that they could possibly opt into different unions within the same workplace. And what would that mean? How would it operate? Finally, uh, what would be the pros and cons of the fair pay agreement system to negotiate something new versus an extension strategy where you take a collective agreement that's already in place and then try to extend it to other uh, workplaces? Um, Mark and Sarah, any thoughts uh, on those questions from Denise? Uh, well, let me try, perhaps go first. Um, uh, ex all excellent questions. So under the New Zealand model, uh, occupational health and safety is in the mandatory to discuss category. It's not in the mandatory to agree category. Uh, our proposal essentially adopts a similar approach. Um, and again, you know, this is, this, is, this is merely a proposal. The one thing I would say is that obviously uh, occupational health and safety is an area of workplace regulation that has a statutorily enforced series of standards and, and laws. So I'm not necessarily, so I think it was probably, at least from my perspective, that was one of the rationales behind not making it mandatory agree, to agree on those issues, but rather something the party should discuss as opposed to necessarily include in a collective agreement. But I could certainly be persuaded otherwise. I don't, I, I can see the rationale for having it, for having it in the mandatory to agree category as well. The New Zealanders chose it to be something that the parties had to discuss. 
Um, the second issue around multiple unions in one workplace. Um, so there's a number of ways that could sort of play out, but let me try and give you a very quick overview. So if you have a workplace that is already represented by a union that has a collective agreement and then gets covered by an FPA, you would continue to be covered by your collective agreement. You would continue to be a member of that union. You would pay dues to that union. And uh, in the event that the FPA bargaining led to something, a, a term and condition of employment that was superior to what was in your collective agreement, then you would get the benefit of the FPA bargain. Uh, and presumably that could be enforced by your union that would by definition be part of the council of unions that had negotiated the FPA. If you're in a non-union workplace and you get covered by an FPA, uh, you would obviously get the benefit of the FPA, but you would not necessarily be required to be a member of any particular union that was in the council that had negotiated the FPA. Um, and I want to pick up a little bit on something Patrice raised, because it, it, it is something I think we spent an enormous amount of time debating amongst ourselves, which is the question of membership and dues. It seems to, it seems to me, at least, that if you are bargaining in a, on the basis of a non-majoritarian certification method, that is to say, you, the number of workers that are in, covered by the FPA far exceeds the number of workers who may have indicated a desire to be represented by the FPA, to then insist on mandatory union dues deduction and or mandatory union membership uh, is going to be problematic in a, in a number of ways. So instead, you don't, the, the dues are, you may, any worker can choose to be a member of any of the unions that are in the council in their workplace, and they get a sort of suite of representational rights, and their dues are covered by their employer. That's the method, that's a sort of slight twist on the New Zealand model that we came up with. And yes, it may absolutely mean that workers in one workplace may be represented by multiple different unions. That's not uncommon in many parts of the world. Uh, it's some, it's less common in Canada, but it's not uncommon in other parts of the world that that's the case. And I think we, we, you know, again, folks would have to wrap their minds around that, but that is the, that is the inevitable result of the system. Um, and it would create potentially interesting competitive tensions between unions. I'm not so sure that's a bad thing either, just by the way. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot Morna's, uh, the last question that was raised in this, in this, in the three, Jim. Um, Hi. I can try and address the last one. Go ahead, Sarah, sure, thank you. Um, so the, the question, uh, if I recall correctly, was about extension models. Yes. And what are the pros and cons of this compared to extension models? So, you know, the, the extension models um, typically, uh, I'll think of two examples of that, one being the decree system and the other being the agent ready model um, that was proposed in BC many years ago and which has gained renewed attention both in Canada and the United States uh, in recent years. So under those, uh, you have, first of all, certification, you know, under the usual Wagner model majoritarian uh, basis and uh, negotiation of a collective agreement. And then that collective agreement is extended. So in, in one instance to an entire sector in, in the, under the Beijing Ready model, to additional workplaces one by one. And under that model, those individual workplaces actually have to show majority support uh, for representation also. So th th there are two real difficulties with this that the Fair Pay Act model uh, avoids. One is the difficulty of majority, uh, majoritarian certification and meeting that threshold. Uh, secondly, Objections to those types of system extension systems in the past, uh, very acutely in British Columbia, for example, when the Beijing Ready model was actually being considered, uh, was that it was not democratic. And unions were, were among the groups that were making that argument. And those extension models are, can be regarded as non-democratic, first of all, in terms of uh, the representation, the extension itself. Um, and secondly, in the application of the collective agreement. So that negotiated collective agreement is then applied uh, to the extended groups. Um, in subsequent negotiations, those workers may well have a say or have the opportunity to have a say in negotiating subsequent collective agreements, but at least in the first instance, they do not. So 
that, that was a significant barrier to uh, adoption of some sectoral models, including the Beijing Rene model in the past. So, you know, you could contemplate a, a non-majoritarian representation test um, and, and combine that with the extension feature, but that seems quite complicated. And my concern would be that it would be even more uh, vulnerable to arguments about lack of being democratic and lack of reflecting worker voice, because with a, a non-majoritary non-majoritarian test for representation, um, it, it, it's it, I think it would also have less credibility among policymakers and certainly employers uh, if it then got extended to workers who had no say at all um, in the extension or informing the the collective agreement. Uh, Sarah, stay on, because uh, here's another question that I think builds on this uh, from sure. Eric Tucker. How would you compare this FPA system to the designated bargaining agent or designated bargaining sector approach uh, as uh, practiced in Ontario? So, uh, and maybe Eric can correct me if I'm, if, or Mark even could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking that this is, the um uh, are we talking about the public sector designated bargaining agent uh, sectoral bargaining agent um yes uh if that's the case um you know it's certainly not uncommon in the public sector to have statutorily designated bargaining agents um that's not democratic at all uh so far the the courts have suggested that it's also not contrary to the freedom of association so um, this is different in the sense that uh, it's not statutorily designated sectors or bargaining representatives, that there is uh, worker input into um, representation choices, and there is uh, feedback and comment uh, available uh, for proposed sectors, and they do have to meet the test of being uh, appropriate for collective bargaining. So Eric, if I have um, misstated, this, uh, understood your designation. Yeah, Eric said sector. teachers was an example. So I think you're yeah, on the right exactly. track, Sarah. Yeah. Right, okay, excellent. Mark, anything to add on that? Either the extension model. No, not especially. I mean, model. no, I think Sarah's uh, covered it. Right, okay, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of follow-ups to earlier questions. Somebody uh, has put a link into the chat that people might want to check with some data and information on the uh, Quebec child care negotiating system. Uh, that looks like a useful resource. Uh, secondly, uh, our friend Peggy Nash has put in the chat, uh, based on her experience, multiple union representation in airlines. That is uh, That gives me a headache just thinking about it, Peggy. So uh, thank you for mentioning that. Just another example of how it gets very complicated when you have multiple unions. Uh, in a particular workplace or even in a particular industry. So we'll just uh, kind of take that as a, a cautionary note. Uh, Shalom Schachter has uh, a number of questions in the in the uh, Q&A uh, as well. Um, uh, Shalom, uh, maybe I'll pick one that seems uh, very relevant to how do we make this happen. Uh, Shalom is asking about the uh, federal versus provincial jurisdictions and the politics uh, around that, even in an NDP uh, government situation, as Sarah indicated. the. Uh, the uh, challenges to implementing something like this are daunting. Um, in other provinces, of course, it's going to be far-fetched. Uh, what about the federal jurisdiction as a possible place to try uh, stretching the envelope on this? Um, either of you or any of the speakers, uh, other speakers, like to address this? Um, if it's okay, Jim, it's Mark here. Maybe I'll start at least with a few quick thoughts. Um, so I just... I, the country of New Zealand has about 6 million uh, residents, and it's geographically very small. Uh, one of the things to note is the actual New Zealand legislation does not contemplate any geographic scope whatsoever, which is to say any FPA has to cover the entire country, full stop. Now, because we're obviously a larger country and we have lots of different jurisdictions, we have uh, proposed that there would be some sort of geographic scope. But I think 
I actually think the best jurisdiction in which to try this model would be a smaller jurisdiction to start, probably not necessarily the federal jurisdiction, just a smaller, both geographically and even in terms of number of people jurisdiction would be the best place to start. I don't know if that, I mean, at the moment, uh, uh, there's not a panoply of progressive governments to choose from, to be blunt about it. Uh, Quebec, I think, I think the other place would actually be Quebec, to be honest with you, because it does have a history of, of the decree system of statutory extension of collective agreements and other, and other models. So I actually think the more important issue is what jurisdiction would best fit in terms of being able to build up the resources and regime necessary and gain the acceptance of the employer and union communities to proceed with this kind of model. I think that's what you would look at first and foremost. I wanna go back to uh, Peggy Nash's comment about it being challenging for unions to work together. Uh, that is uh, absolutely true. The problem though is our current system of labor relations actually is, provides many disincentives for unions to actually work together constructively. That's one of its central problems in my view. This system requires, would mandate that unions have to actually work together in bargaining and even in terms of representation. I remember I attended a seminar that I think you organized Jim on the New Zealand system a year and a half ago when it wasn't even yet draft legislation. And that was one of the first questions that unions posed, which is, are unions really going to get together and be able to work together on a on a, on a broad sectoral agreement? Uh, and and the gentleman who was there from New Zealand said, yes, actually unions are working together and strategizing together about how to organize a sector of the economy. Wouldn't that be a fabulous thing to see in our underrepresented sectors of our uh, uh, in Canada? Like I would I, I would love to see that. And I think this system, one of its virtues, is that it actually not it provides incentives for that to happen. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for that. Uh, hey, friends, uh, my apologies. Uh, just got a note in the chat that the chat was not enabled for everyone. So many of those chat posts, including that one with the link to Quebec, were not coming through. So I have just enabled the chat for everyone, including all the attendees, my apologies. And if the anonymous person who sent that Quebec link could send it again now, uh, that would be great. And any other links uh, to share that way. Uh, so uh, time for just a couple of quick ones. Um, uh, I'll just uh, kind of cherry pick here a little bit. Uh, Gregor Murray uh, has said, how is this fair pay agreement system better than a kind of a, a living wage or a, an Australian awards type of uh, floor that is established? He's thinking it has to do with worker voice and participation in the process of negotiating it. But perhaps uh, Sarah and or Mark could elaborate on that. Uh, I guess, well, I, I'll just quickly, I think, I think you're absolutely right, Gregor, that we started from the premise, as Sarah mentioned, that we wanted to have democratically accountable uh, trade unions be at the center of the negotiation of these of these agreements. Uh, and so that's kind of the premise from which we started from that the challenge is with respect to more uh, government focused minimum standards legislative models is that they often they, they, the trade union movement isn't at the center of them. And so there is a, there, there can be concerns around dem democratically unaccountable organizations setting wage rates for, for large sections of the economy. I think that's right. Sarah, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but. Um, I'll just uh, address the living wage. The, the difficulty with, uh, the difficulty with uh, living wage in some contexts is that, you know, there, there are geographic differences between cost of living. And I realize that a number of living wage um, systems take that into account, um, though it's difficult to do. But there are also differences um, you know, between occupation and between industry. And this, the Fair Pay Act system goes beyond wages. Um, it, it covers at least the mandatory issues. Uh, there are also uh, additions, uh, additional issues that can be uh, addressed. And beyond that, the parties can also negotiate any other matter that lead, that relates to labor and employment. So you know, living wage is limited in that respect. So I, I think that this potentially uh, can offer workers uh, significantly more benefits in terms of a floor that uh, could cover a number of areas of significant terms and conditions of work. Excellent. 
Uh, well, look, friends, I think we've kind of reached uh, the end of our window here for this uh, webinar and for the Q&A. With that, uh, I'll adjourn the webinar. Thank you for your interest in this, uh, everyone. Thank you for your interest in our Centre for Future Work. Stay tuned for more details and uh, best wishes uh, with the rest of your day. All right. Thanks, everyone.